Hi there, friends. Maybe you are interested in the broader patterns of the field of your science, what's going on, what's been done. Maybe you're after documenting some systematic patterns in your particular field of inquiry. Then you're basically interested in literature synthesis. This, well, this was also the situation I was in a couple years ago, and I feel that um, a lot of people are not fully aware of the options you have when you're interested in documenting such broad patterns. I mean, many of you will have heard of narrative reviews, and many of you will also be familiar with meta-analysis, but I think these are not all the options. And I don't know for a fact if all options are applicable equally well to all scientific fields out there if you are in a field different from mine, like environmental science, but I also see no real reason why this shouldn't be the case. And so in this video, I want to talk about systematic mapping as a technique for getting a broad overview over a body of literature. And when I first heard of it a, a couple of years ago, this was kind of a revelation for me, and I hope you will also find it interesting if you haven't heard of it before. So first I want to go over these three options for literature synthesis in the broadest sense to make sure that we're on the same page here. And your three choices is writing a narrative review, conducting a meta-analysis, or doing a systematic mapping. So a narrative review I'm sure you're all familiar with and you've probably all either at least read one or several or have also already written one. A narrative review is often more like a personal view of a research field. It's colored by your opinion, your experience, and what the patterns that you see, basically. In a narrative review, usually the search terms are not disclosed in any detail, and it's not clear how systematically the literature has really been accessed for a narrative review. Also, typically, narrative reviews don't systematically extract certain pieces of information from each paper. It's more like, this is the overview of that literature, and I highlight some points and um, introduce some patterns and come to some conclusions. This is a narrative review. A meta-analysis is a completely different ballgame. The first bit of a meta-analysis is to systematically search the literature with fully disclosed search terms and search criteria, inclusion, exclusion criteria. And then you extract also from every paper effect sizes. So you extract actually data from each paper. And then afterwards you go through a set of highly customized, specialized and ever developing statistical techniques to analyze these data. So meta-analysis is basically a deep dive into the data that's being presented in papers. And the third option is the one I want to talk about in this video in more detail. I have a feeling it is the least known of these three options, and that is systematic mapping. So basically, when is a systematic mapping in order, or when is a systematic mapping a good idea? And there are three points. The first point is when you are interested in a field that is so broad and where there are so many papers, let's say hundreds of papers, that it would almost be unreasonable to do a meta-analysis. But you want to just get an overview of this broad field and document in a systematic way what has been done in this field. This is where the name systematic mapping comes from. You systematically basically map what has been done or not done. The second condition is, is very related. It's basically you're not interested in extracting the data. If you're interested in extracting effect sizes, then we're talking about a meta-analysis. But usually the field is so broad that it would be almost unreasonable to do a meta-analysis on that, on all of these uh, papers that you have found. Uh, but you're more interested in just generally what has been done rather than what has been found. So it's more on, you could almost think about the methods or the, the responses that have generally been gathered or the, the metadata of these studies, but not the results per se that are of interest. So you're not interested in um, coming up with an answer about an average effect is like this, and it's mostly introduced by those and those moderators. That's meta-analysis. And maybe the third point is um, your, your field that you want to synthesize is, is so broad and heterogeneous that maybe you can't even come up with a very good response that you could use as an effect size to synthesize over this broad area. 
So basically you're not finding any variables that could be very easily compared. And then since the focus is really not, as I mentioned, on extracting effect sizes and results, then also, meta, uh, then also systematic mapping is the method of choice. So let's say you have this curiosity about a very broad field, let's say all of pollution research or all of climate change research or any other very broad area. And therefore you would be interested in doing a systematic mapping exercise. So how does this actually work? And there are several steps to follow. Um, there's also specialized literature if you're interested in each of these points in more detail. This is more like an overview so you get a, an impression of what this will be like. The first step is of course to define your question. Well that question needs to be sufficiently broad so that it covers quite a bit of the literature so that you can find interesting patterns in the first place. So it shouldn't be a very specific question. It should be a rather broad question like what has been basically done in, in climate change in respect to plants or something like this. So a very, very broad research field that um, you would be expected to find hundreds or maybe even thousands of papers. So this means also that the research field needs to have attained a certain level of maturity so that there is enough uh, papers out there. It can't be something that's very new and emerging. If it's new and emerging, maybe then, you know, write an opinion paper or do a, a, a very small uh, meta-analysis even. But, you know, for a systematic mapping to be useful, the field needs to have attained a certain level of maturity. Yeah, there's of course always an art form in designing this question right, because, you know, we just talked about it can't be too narrow, because otherwise you're unlikely to see any interesting patterns. But it also cannot be a, like a never-ending uh, question, because otherwise you will have, you know, maybe many thousands or, or tens of thousands of papers to go through and that will of course be logistically almost impossible. So it cannot also be too broad. It needs to be just right. <laughs> and uh, one way to get this question right, you know, you're unlikely to get it right right, right off the bat. I think it's, it's, it's much more likely that you start with a, with a certain question. You do an exploratory search. You see, well, how many hits do I get and how difficult will it be to sort through them? Do I capture very many irrelevant papers and so on and so forth? And so you, you refine your question over time uh, until you arrive at one that has a reasonable number of hits. The second part is you define your search term because it's of course very important in a systematic mapping paper in the end that you report very carefully your search term. This is like the open part as compared to a narrative review where the search term is essentially never re revealed. It's just basically what the author knows or what he or she has um, basically searched for. Specifically, is not usually mentioned in a narrative review. Not so here. Here you need to be very careful about the search term. And as you probably know, if you've done um, real searches, uh, defining a search term is not a trivial matter. You're unlikely to get it right from the very beginning. You are needing to refine that search term iteratively to make it better and better, to make sure that it captures the relevant sources. How do you do that? Well, you start generally with some papers that you know well in the field you want to do a systematic mapping for, and you write down the terms that they're using, and the keywords and title words, words are used in the abstract, and then you, you go forth and backwards in time. Basically, you look at the papers that cite these papers and also note down the terms that they have used. And you look at the relative literature that that paper cited and you do the same. And so over time, you come up with a better and better uh, set of terms that capture the topic that you're really after. As I said, this is very, very unlikely that you get this right from the very beginning. This is an iterative process. It takes time and actually a lot of effort. This is not a trivial matter because everything rises and falls with the quality of your search term, of course. A common mistake I see um, in, in classes where we're working on search terms is that people try to get the search term very specific so it only really captures and spits out the papers that you're interested in. It's a common misconception that is not the goal. The goal is that your search term should really cover everything. And so by doing that, it will almost always also capture irrelevant papers that you afterwards will have to sort out or by excluding certain, sub certain subject areas, you can do that as well. But the goal is really to capture the field as fully as possible, not precisely that you get only the relevant papers put out from your search. There's a lot of things that can be said about search terms. It's an art form. It takes a long time and it takes effort. So it's important to take it seriously and also to go in this with your eyes open because you're not going to do that in an afternoon.
Then it's also very important that it also needs to be in, uh, disclosed in your paper what were your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So at what point is this inside of your bubble that you want to do a systematic mapping for and at what point is it outside. This can really be anything, it's uh, depending on your question. You know, it can be, well, I'm only interested in field work, I'm only interested in lab work, I'm only interested in tropical forests, so I'm only interested in soil. It can be basically at any level of domain, any attribute um, can be used to refine your search. Of course, the point is to get a fairly broad overview. So, so with your inclusion and exclusion criteria, you shouldn't be too narrow, of course. So up to here, it's basically the same as a, as a meta-analysis. You need to be very careful about the question you're asking. You need to define it very clearly. Um, you need to de define your search terms and put a lot of effort in that. And then you um, document and clearly lay out your inclusion and exclusion criteria that you need to justify what paper is in and what paper is out. But from then on it diverges. So when in a meta-analysis you would now like start extracting data from the papers and put them in a data table, here what you do is you basically design your list of attributes that you want to scan for. And next to the question that you asked in the first place, this is really the creative bit, this attribute listing. Like what aspects, what aspects of the metadata of this particular paper or set of papers do you really want to extract? What response variables have been measured? What organisms has this study been done with? And what ecosystem type did it take place? And so on and so forth. And that is, of course, the art. Huh? So it um, can be quite a long list of attributes. So the more you extract from all of the papers, the better. Uh, because the more stuff you have to play with in the end and in terms of the result. But this is really where the magic is and this is also where you need to very carefully think about. Of course, you're only going to see interesting patterns and also interesting gaps if you uh, choose the right attributes also at the right levels with the right subcategories within each attribute, right? So, I mean, attribute could be as, for example, ecosystem type, then how how deep do you basically divide this up? You know, grassland, forest, agriculture, or do you use biomes or do you get more fine-grained? Depends on how broad your data set is and so on and so forth. So the, really the art is in, and a lot of thinking has to go into the design of these attribute lists. And so you can, in the, in the end, you can imagine your data table is basically the rows of the individual studies or papers, and then the columns are these attributes. Yeah, and then comes basically the mapping. Once you have defined your inclusion exclusion criteria, once you have set up your list of attributes, basically your table is ready to be filled, then you do the screening, then you do the mapping. You go through every paper, you will have to read the papers actually, um, mo in most cases at least the method section but also the results section to see what has been done, where it has been done. You may also need to use additional sources outside of the paper, for example, if they didn't say what soil type they used or where the study was located. You can fill the table also with other additional information that you obtain from elsewhere. But this takes a lot of time. Huh? This is not something that you do uh, in just a couple, a couple of days. Um, this takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time because you have to obtain the paper, you have to look in the paper, you have to find where in the paper is that information because sometimes that is not so easy. Yeah, and so this takes a, a long time actually to fill this data table depending on how many uh, studies you have. If you have a couple hundred or even thousand, then it can take quite a while. If you do this with other people, this is of course recommended because you know the time is divided by the number of people. You need to still ensure that we are all doing uh, the same things, basically. So it's also good to have some overlap and to agree on, you know, what do you call this and what do you call that, basically, in your attribute list. This is not so trivial. So I think that also requires a lot of sort of planning ahead of time and coordination. So then when you have that, you have your data and then there is specific um, graphs that are very often used like uh, balloon plots or heat maps or just general kinds of display items, how you just depict your result. Basically, this is what's been done. This is the number of papers that include forest versus grassland for this particular question. So you get these broad sweeping patterns in however many attributes you, you picked basically and how I many levels per ad attribute you can, you can depict then these results. This is the result, is like what has been done, usually number of papers that have done this or that. And then of course the paper is in the end you discuss these patterns and say like wow, um, in this very important question nobody has done this in agricultural systems but people have done this for example in, in a forestry context. 
so you can uh, uncover interesting and surprising sometimes <laughs> gaps and you can document what has been really well researched and you can sort of say what's you can also look at patterns through time you can see like uh, what is like a current trend what are people currently doing all this is fair game so I think that then it's only limited really by your imagination and curiosity what you do with the data that you have obtained how do you present it and also what conclusions do you draw from that so this is the output is this very well documented standardized map of this particular field that's been done in a systematic way that you know how many papers have done this that and the other thing and so it's a very complete picture basically of this of this field and that of course of course is a is a value in itself right? it almost seems like a, a if you're starting a phd you should do that for your field so you get sort of an an overview of the broader area of your of your field so this is of course a, a result in an, in in itself and, and it can be published but it can also be a starting point for further inquiry. And so this has been the case for us. You know, we did some systematic mappings, then we realized, holy cow, nobody has really done this. It seems like fairly obvious. And nobody has really done this combination of attributes, like something in the lab with incubation and this particular response variable. It seems like a huge gap, but we really didn't find any papers that did that, for example. And that was definitely not clear when we started sort of screening the literature in, this, in that particular example, when we, when we started out with this question, that sort of just really came out in a systematic mapping exercise. And I think this is why this is so cool, because you can really very clearly and very reproducibly document also such research gaps. And then, of course, you can um, follow up, right? You can, you can do an experiment on exactly that research gap, which is we, what we are doing. Um, or you can take a subset of maybe of a systematic map and do a meta-analysis when you see this is particularly well supported by papers, uh, but not too huge. And so, yeah, this can be a result in itself, but also a starting point for follow-up work. So I hope you got a pretty good overview of what this is and what it means and how it could be useful in your situation. And if you want to do that, best of luck to you. And thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Bye.